Good morning. So excited to be here. Hi, everybody. Happy International Women's Day. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, well, this is very exciting. And, you know, I, first of all, Amber, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And as you can tell from all of our incredible partners, it is truly about the power of collaboration and such an important way to kick off women supporting women. And I think that's really what this is all about. Um, it is about this incredible network. And I think that's what we're gonna talk about, a network. And this conversation is such an important conversation, the power of women as investors. And as I was reading up about all of you incredible women, I had this incredible idea, I think at 5 a.m. as I landed in New York and I called Susan this morning and I'm like, oh my God, I have this incredible idea that inspired me, you know, reading about all of you incredible women supporting other women. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's get started because we have a lot to talk about. Hashtag own your worth. It is about believing in yourself first and about confidence, especially as investors and knowing your value, knowing what you're all about, believing in yourself because financial literacy, financial confidence starts within. So let's get to it. Um, this is a really important conversation, especially on International Women's Day, even though I think that every day should be Women's Day. So, right, we're nodding our heads already. So we're going to do this in two parts. Part one is going to be all about um, really understanding the power of women and are we getting more powerful in understanding our wealth and the stages of where we're at. And so we're gonna break it into two parts. And so for International Women's Day 2022, um, we have a panel where we're really exploring the UN's theme of gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow through the financial lens. And we're celebrating the critical changes that women are bringing to the invest in the investment landscape. Is it changing? Is it evolving? Are we growing? Are we getting stronger in our wealth? Is our wealth growing? Um, and so we have two very experienced women with us in the world of financial services. And I have to say the gender lens, I think one of us has been doing this for quite some time. So I think you might've had some foresight in this space. Um, so we're going to share what's happening across the world. And then we also have two amazing female social entrepreneurs from emerging markets um, to share their insights on how women are growing in our roles of bringing positive social impact and sustainable growth to the economies. And so when we start thinking about um, why it's so important for women to start making their own financial decisions, is this a new thing? Is this a result of the pandemic? Why is it so important for women to start taking financial decisions in their own hands? So we're gonna break it into two parts. Part one, we're gonna start with um, Suni and Susan, Suzanne in, in this whole area um, of the space. So let's, let's talk about that. And Suni, I wanna start with you in this area to give us some key takeaways. And I wanna really, open up the conversation and think about it in some, some key areas, um, talking about women's wealth. We know that women's wealth is growing and I know there was a whole new report that um, just came out. Can you talk about some of the key takeaways um, in terms of the trends towards women wanting and taking more control? Are we taking more control? Are we just thinking that we wanna take more control or are we actually taking more control in this area. That is, that is the trick, Shelley. Thank you so much for, for being here with us uh, here at UBS. Um, so yes, will, women's wealth is growing and there's a trend toward women wanting and taking control of their financing. For example, the number of women who say they're more interested in investing since COVID uh, is up 50%. And that's not just within their retirement plan, that's their overall financial health. So their financial power is driving change. And the report that we just put out looks at how we at UBS and the wider industry are changing as a result. So there's a great trend to see as it speaks to improvement in the quality of life of these women and their ability to close the wealth and pension gaps. For me, I like to see an increase in financial independence among women 
which the report also speaks to in terms of married women taking on more of the financial decisions in the family. So we have a way to go there and we're still dealing with social mores and the example set by our parents where dad managed the money, um, but we are seeing a real shift. And of course, this all varies by country and region, just as social mores vary by country and region. The report also speaks to how women are different as stewards of wealth, which of course has implications for how we service those clients, women's roles within the financial services industry, female fund managers, for example, the investment decisions they're making, the products and delivery channels we create, and the impact right across the investment ecosystem. I mean, it's just, it's so amazing because we know that it is impacting um, in, in such different ways, especially with pay disparity, career dis continuity. I mean, everything in the pandemic has also set us back disproportionately and women disproportionately to men in so many different ways. Life expectancy is, uh, you know, we're starting to look at all these different factors, risk tolerance. We know that women have risk tolerance different than men. So the difference between men and women um, also are impacting the changes. So why is this all so important and starting to surface in, in different ways? We know that if women invest, invested at the same rate as men, there could be more than $3.2 trillion of additional capital to invest globally with over 1.87 trillion flowing into more responsible investing to tackle the world's most pressing issues like healthcare and climate. So it's also very important for quality of life for these women and for them to be more able to close the wealth and pension gap. So we know that this is so incredibly important more than ever before. We do, that's exactly right. And, and again, if you think about the, the other big trend out here on the ESG and sustainability and impact investing, we do know and the, and the, and the research points to that women are more thoughtful in how they manage their money. They care a lot more that their values are reflected in their investments that they make. So you're going to see, as you say, more money flowing into climate, um, healthcare. I mean, if you took that uh, 1.87 trillion, I think it is, if women invested at the rate as, of men, you could actually realize all of the 17 SDG goals that are out there. So there is tremendous power behind women becoming more active investors, for women taking more ownership of their wealth and the decisions that are made there. So it's incredibly powerful. And so, you know, are, are you starting to take into account life stage and, you know, bringing more of a focus in these different areas? Are you starting to see women prioritizing life stage in different ways now? Yeah, of course, women have always invested um, very around pivotal times in their in their career. And this is why when I mentioned wealth independence, um, that's an important thing because historically women didn't pay attention and women found themselves as widows or they found themselves divorced without the wherewithal to manage their financing financings. And that made it very difficult for them. So um, so the, the fact that the industry and, and UBS, of course, leading with things that are unique to women and how they approach their investing, um, the pivotal moments that might be happening to them now, but also in the future, um, we talk about... Um, uh, liquidity, longevity, and legacy. And, and those, those are unique points for every investor, but they have a different twist if they're women as well. So again, catering and being aware of the needs unique to the female gender uh, makes for a better discussion and better planning across our client base. So let's, Suzanne, let's go to you because we talk about gender lens investing and, you know, Suni just brought that up. You have been focused on gender lens investing for a very long time. And I mean, I don't know if you've got the crystal ball. So where did, I mean, because you have not just started doing this since 2017. You've been doing this for, I don't know, 20 years. I mean, for a very long time. Like, where did this crystal ball come from? Like, what got you started on gender lens investing? Well, for me, I was, and thank you. Um, it's so good to be here with you, Shelly, and, and all of you. I was an entrepreneur. And my partner and I led a very successful ed tech company. And she and I know that the power of the company was very much from recognizing the diversity that was within our own team and thinking about how we had that team, how we thought about our customers, how we thought about product design, how we thought about our own supply chain. 
And when I, when we sold the business to a multinational, I became an investor myself, but I thought my capital will never be as big as the capital that I can unlock by really thinking of this, about this from a systemic point of view. So I went to my fellow cashed out tech entrepreneurs. I went to the world of philanthropy where I was starting to spend some time. I went to everyone in both the sort of mainstream investor realm, but also the people that were really already investing with their values, investing with a sustainability and impact point of view. This is 20 years ago and said, why aren't we thinking more about where women are in the picture? And if we've got wealth that we've created, and I don't care whether it's $500 or $5 million or $50 million, we of all people should be investing it in other women and in companies that are good for women and in companies that are about equity. And so that really was where my journey started. Fast forward uh, in 2017, I started working with Wharton Business School, where I'm an alum, on a on a, a report called Project Sage. We've now done four of these reports since then, um, tracking where the venture capital, private equity, and private debt has gone with a gender lens. And from when I started investing, maybe there was one public markets fund I could be in. I, there were a handful of venture capital funds. Now there are hundreds of venture capital, private equity, private debt funds. There are more than 60 private uh, public markets funds, including one from UBS, um, that are, you know, again, now reaching the level of a billion dollars in assets under management from starting from nothing. Um, and so, you know, I'm looking at where can I invest in directly in entrepreneurs? Where can we be in funds? Where can we be in community investments that focus on uh, low income and especially communities of color and all the way through to public markets. And that's the work I've been doing is to shine a light um, now with this initiative, Gender Smart, which I co-founded in 2018, um, to shine a light on how we invest this way and especially how women can invest this way. And women who are not only individual allocators, but also people sitting in professional investment seats because that's part of how we're going to change things. It's just really getting to 50-50 in terms of who's deploying and allocating the capital. Well, and I find it, and, and this is just for both of you, I, I, I just, I've been following, you know, the whole concept of the journey and the investing journey and the difference between the men and women and the wealth journey. And I find it fascinating that, you know, we talk about risk and you know, women are risk averse. And so, you know, and UBS is doing such an amazing job of, and you know, every, for everyone tuning in, you'll see in the chat, the, the paper and th that just came out. And I encourage all of you to read it because I have been reading it and I just love watching how now you are really helping women and educating women on you know, how to navigate the journey and especially the life stage and giving us the confidence to you know, follow our path and to get stronger and stronger in it. Just talk about the differences facing men and women in the wealth journey. And Suni, I think, you know, just map out what you talk about in the paper because it's just so fascinating how you identify the steps in the journey. Well, and, and, and so let's start with your first comment, which it is, it, it is kind of the, the urban myth, right? That women are more risk averse. We actually don't think women are risk averse per se, and the data shows that, but uh, women are more thoughtful and calculating in the risks that they do take. And notably, they appear to be less emotional, which will surprise everybody, right? Less emotional. I was very surprised by that. Right? Less emotional investors than men, which means they trade less, uh, less likely to sell at market lows, are much more disciplined. They don't chase the trade, if you will, which makes them smarter investors, I suppose. But again, more thoughtful is not the same as, as, as risk averse. And as we said, they, they go through, they care about their values. They have a long-term plan. They think less about opportunity in their investing and more about security for their families. They think more about when they think about legacy, as I mentioned earlier, um, differently than just leaving their money, but making sure that their children are well equipped to handle wealth and handle that transfer and be able to be happy on their journey as opposed to just the monetary side of that. So, so women are different, similar, uh, but different. And I will never again say women are more risk averse than men. And it's true because 
you know, that's what I was thinking when I went into reading the paper and I came out with different language of thoughtful versus risk averse. And, and, and hey, you, you've invested in your own business. You've invested in other women's businesses through who you choose to work with in your supply chain, who you choose to not only put your money into, but your connectivity and your relationship capital. And so I think the reality is that there are a whole group of women out there, and I'm, I'm lucky because I get to meet so many of them, that are backing venture funds. They're backing entrepreneurs. They're backing, they, they're, they know it because they've invested in themselves, um, or they know it because they see women entrepreneurs and fund managers who are backing the companies uh, that are exactly doing exactly what we need to solve the problems of the day, whether it's climate, whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in aging, whether it's in, um, you know, the next scientific discovery. This is really um, growing. Is the women that are they're risk aware, to uh, Suni's point, but they're not risk averse. But, but that helped right, me guess, a lot in the yeah. language in terms of, you know, and a lot of the things that I was reading about, which I wanted to talk to you about, was how we use the language in asking for the loans or asking for the investment. The language is very important. And I thought that was very important, by the way, in the paper. Go ahead, Suni, I didn't mean to you know, I just I was gonna say exactly to that point, right? One of the things that, that is important because everybody's on this journey together and they're at different stages of the journey. So we talk a lot and, and, and a lot of our products and our relationships are built on increasing confidence of women, because as you say, the language you use, the, the ability to say, I'm going to invest in that, the confidence that you can do it, the confidence that you've done your homework and that, that you own that decision is very much a part of that journey. And it's great to see that's a trend that we love seeing is that that confidence level continues to increase for women. And then also- Go ahead. Shall I just add one thing? I think we have to flip even the language around entrepreneurs asking for a loan, asking for investment. I look at Ajayta and Joanna, and who we're going to hear from soon. And I think when I spoke to, when I first met both of them years and years ago, it was very much about um, how can we work together so that you can help me grow this business to help you realize the change you want to see in the world and not asking for my capital or the capital of other people I knew but making it an opportunity and saying it's a privilege to get to invest in entrepreneurs and fund managers and those who are really making this change. So I think even flipping the language about what are we, quote, who's doing the asking <laughs> and what is that power relationship, but what is the relationship that we're in as we make this change? Okay, so I am gonna break script again, as you all know, I do all the time. So Jeta and Joanna, I want you to, I think I'm going to bring you in to this conversation. I know I'm supposed to do this in two parts. So everyone at UBS, I apologize. Sorry, not sorry. I'm going to bring you in because what I'm going to talk to you, Suzanne, about from that Africa summit that I read about, one of the problems that you identified was women being afraid to ask for the loans was mm -hmm. one of the things you identified. So you just brought up part of the script that was a, an issue that women were uncomfortable asking for loans. So you just identified one of the issues. So we're gonna bring this in to the conversation about being uncomfortable asking for loans because now you're talking about script. We need to rewrite the scripts of making it part of the conversation. We shouldn't be uncomfortable asking for scripts. It's part of the conversations. It should be a, a, a partnership, right? Isn't that what you just said, right? And whether and whether it's debt or whether it's equity or whether it's revenue-based financing or invoice financing or production financing, the right kind of capital for the right, you know, are, are we talking about growth capital? Are we talking about working capital? Like really knowing and the investor and the entrepreneur knowing what they're talking about in dialogue with each other, like having the same conversation and being aligned. But yeah, I would love to hear from Joanna and Ajayta. Okay, so I'm gonna bring you in just to answer that and then I'll, I'll keep it as proto protocol because I still need to finish part one of conversation. What is your opinion on that? Who wants to jump in from Joanna and Ajayta? Cause I see you both here. Sure, I can jump in. Um, yeah, I think entrepreneurs are also on the journey. When I first started the company, started raising, I wasn't as comfortable, but you know, as the business grew, 
as we grew more and more revenue, as our margins were stronger than our competition, I became more and more confident. And I want certain investors in this company. We're growing something big. We're growing something exciting and world changing. And for me, it's about bringing in the right partners. So I think for me, it was a, a confidence journey as well. Uh, but yeah, and you, you learn over time. And as you grow your business, I think the important thing is having confidence in knowing I mean, I know my business inside and out. I know every lever in our business. I'm so proud of our team. And for me, just what we've built and who we are and what we do, that, that brings me confidence. And I think that's harder when you're just starting out, you know, you're really early, but once you have the data, you have the traction, you have the growth, it's, it's much easier. But that also I mean, might I, be, yeah. it also Sorry. might be that an investor should put in their investor pitch that says, we are the type of investor that wants you to know that, you know, we're good with you, you know, asking for X, Y, and Z so that the, you know, the, the business knows that you are that kind of investor. So they're not uncomfortable. So, the I mean, I, so I'll just chime into this with kind of alluding to the point that Suzanne was bringing up, which was also the the fact that you as an entrepreneur have the confidence that you have something to offer on the table that is value add and that actually it is a partnership. It's not a, I need you and a transaction. So fundamentally when you're coming into the, uh, the into that stage of, of interaction as an entrepreneur, I've always asked the investor what their thesis is and what they have to offer on the table and what capital can they, and it's not just about the capital, but it's also about, beyond capital, right? Uh, the strategy, the partnership, the vision. If we have the confidence that we have something to offer on the table, which we do, we are some of the few companies that ultimately are being able to give uh, both profit, growth, scale, and incredible impact, which ultimately is like the best of both worlds. So when you're sitting in front of those investors, having the confidence to say, here's what I have to offer. What do you have to come and give to me in return? And then how do we co-design a productive solution to then take um, our dreams to scale because I can do and you can support, right? And so somewhere I think that that confidence of understanding that we're equals on the table, I think is really critical in really making, um, being able to then deal with the asking for money um, challenge, right? So it's not about, I think where the confidence sometimes for entrepreneurs, especially women uh, is lacking is we don't necessarily have the confidence of asking for a lot of capital. We ask for just enough mm -hmm. to be able to then prove that we are effectively good at doing what we do. And I think maybe that's the bridge. And so if investors can come in and go, you know what? We are so confident in your ability. We actually believe that you need to ask for more. And then that's where I think the give and take comes in to show the solid value that uh, both an entrepreneur and an investor can offer together. Well, oh. I love that. Okay. Sorry, okay. That I, it's changing. I mean, Beyond Capital Ventures is, is a great example of this. You know, there's traditionally this relationship of just investors being, especially VCs, being somewhat extractive. And the investor, you know, works blood, sweat, or the entrepreneur works blood, sweat, and tears. They get more and more diluted. Investors get paid out first. And Beyond Capital Ventures has this new model where they invest in the entrepreneur. And not only, you know, is it about growing together, the entrepreneur actually gets a carry out of their fund. So if the portfolio does well, they, they make more. And so there's interesting and creative ways of that investors are actually competing for entrepreneurs, which is, which is great to see. Wow. I mean, I, I think that we're going to start creating a whole new model. The poor guys, they're going to have to catch up now. <laughs> they're going to have a hard time because we're going to create a whole new gender lens model and the guys are going to be left in the dust. I feel so bad for them now. Okay. We're going to come back to, to you guys in two seconds. Let me just finish this. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Um, okay. Back to Suzanne and um, Suni. Um, all right, Suni, I've got a question for you, which is back to financial products. Um, so with the new uh, female impact change going on in the world. Um, how is this impacting like the financial products and services um, in the sustainable and impact investing solutions um, 
things that you guys are, are starting to do is this evolving your models and also the types of um, services. You know, I, I think another thing that I read is a lot of the men are very happy with um, online, you know, services and women really love the in-person um, hands-on kind of um, yeah, I, I think you know the, the 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 way we cover women has has of course evolved, and we've had our gender segment uh, for for quite some time. And and what we find in the research supports is that women value trust. So again, it's hard to trust the computer, right? That's trust in yourself that you know what you're doing. So the idea of professional money managers and and and, and assistance there, I think, comes more to the fore with women. So um, it's just building on that trust, having that relationship, having that you know, in-person touch, as you say. I mean, the industry is starting to provide uh, products and solutions that appeal to women. I think the key is that they are not pink washed, as we say, right? And that it isn't pink. patronizing. It isn't, you know, looking down on you and you're just a little woman. Let me in in infect you because women don't appreciate that, I guess would, would not surprise anybody on this call, certainly. So um, so again, making those products widely available is there. And, and of course, as we discussed, there's, there's been a major uplift of sustainable impact solutions over recent years. Um, and those are accelerated by the pandemic for all the right reasons. So really right in the wheelhouse of what women have shown they care the most about in terms of the ability to um, execute on their values and their vision for sustainability and social impact. Amazing. And so Suzanne, in, in your part of the world, you know, where are we going with gender smart investing as a result of all of the changes? So one thing that Suni just said that I want to pick up on is that trillions of dollars of capital have gone into ESG funds, and it's still under $20 billion of capital that's gone into labeled gender lens funds. So I think the name of the game right now is to make sure that the gender lens funds grow and they get their capital to really directly in a committed way invest in women entrepreneurs and companies that are good for women, but that we really get gender lens investing as an integral part of ESG investing, the S in ESG and the G, who's in governance and who is really in the workforce, in the supply chain, how do we think about customers, how do we think about um, everyone in that, the, that chain in a company and make sure that we're paying attention to where is it good for women, where is it good for gender equality and gender equity. And when you make things better for women, by the way, you make things better for men. So again, whether you're looking at oceans or you're looking at healthcare or you're looking at uh, alternative uh, energy, you can think about where is the gender lens in a fund that is about alternative energy or about access. So I'm thinking about Ajeta with uh, where she started was in climate. Um, I'm thinking about Joanna was really looking at women's healthcare and access to um, reproductive health products and, and menstrual health products. And you can be leading with something that you care about from an ESG standpoint and from a sustainability standpoint, and you can see where the gender lens is that. Is that company also creating good green jobs when we're talking about a climate investment? Is that company thinking about its broader supply chain when we're looking at Unilever or PNG? And you know, who is making the products um, and selling those products? So I think one place where this is going is to make sure that we as an the investment world makes sure that gender is integrated into all investing. And then for women who are actively investing and talking to their wealth advisors or their financial advisors or whoever they're getting that advice from, can look intelligently at a fund and ask good questions. So yes, you've shown me this fund, which is about water. You know I care about access to clean water. Tell me who's making the investment decisions. Where are women in that picture? Who is who are the entrepreneurs who are being invested in or the companies? Who are the employees of these companies? Who are the customers of these companies? And if women, as I think we're seeing, start to ask better and better questions, then we're not gonna be pinkwashing or greenwashing. We're really gonna be getting things that have the depth and the sophistication and the both impact and the financial returns that we're really looking for. And so I think that's another place that it's going. So that means that the, the financial industry needs to change. We need to build the capacity and the capability to do it. We have to make sure those funds are on the platforms of the UBSs in the, of the world. 
Um, we've got to build that capacity of women as investors to know what to ask for and, and make good decisions in partnership with other people on their team. We've got to make sure that those people who are creating these new funds, um, who are, they're spotting some of the best innovators out there, that they've got to get fully capitalized. Um, and we've got a lot of a lot of work to do to make sure that people see that this is about, as my friend Vicki Saunders from CEO would say, solving the world's to-do list mm -hmm. and really make sure that we're unlocking the power of our, again, our wealth, but also our, uh, our generosity and our activity in terms of our social capital, our intellectual capital, all the forms of capital that we've got to really help these businesses to grow. And that, and given what's going on in the world right now, this is what gives me hope is that this is a growing thing. I mean, we're, we've just got so many challenges in the world, you know, whatever you want to look at, climate, war, um, refugees and migration, the economic challenges that are happening, COVID. What gives me help is when I look at Ajeta and Joanna and I say, they're the ones who are really solving the problems that I care about. And as somebody with wealth and somebody who's engaging people with wealth, it's a privilege it's like the source of hope to get to invest that way. Okay, well, you gave me you gave me heart and hope. Just can I right just now. add one thing? Because I for 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 an entrepreneur, it's also really interesting for me to see, especially like having been a part of the gender smart movement for as long as I have, thanks to Suzanne, is that um, it's also now shifting from the why should we do this to how do we do this. And I think, um, you know, in, and it's wonderful to see um, more and more funds actually asking for tools that will enable them to really assess um, organizations, companies in a very different lens with that deeper lens. So, you know, supply chain to customer design, to product design, to intentionality, but actually providing the tools. And I think, you know, having gender smart and having 2X collaboratives and all the initiatives that are out there, it's nice to see the shift from, should we put money into women? or to how do we actually identify gender champions better so we can effectively make a consistent decision around different verticals. And I think that's really been a wonderful shift to see, um, which excites all of us also equally. Oh, I think that you just nailed it. It's, it's not even the, the why, it's, it's the how. And I think we're getting past the, the basic question. And you know, when Suzanne just talked about the to-do list, I talk about the to-be list. And you know, we also know that the more women that we are starting to see in leadership in Fortune 500, we are moving past the ROI of return on investment to the ROI return on impact. And we're seeing more focus on ESGs, period. And that is just a given. And it's making companies better all around on all of the thresholds and all the numbers that you know, are the important numbers that we need to see beyond bottom line of profit to, you know, impact. So, okay, let's move to part two, because um, part two is also so incredibly important, moving to the power of women as investors and unlocking wealth at scale across the world. So, of course, we already brought both of you incredible women into the conversation. So, Joanna and Ajeta, uh, let's talk about um, the impact of changing the script. And we already started talking about changing the narrative to incredible social entrepreneurs um, um, from India and East Africa. So let's talk about what you guys are seeing um, and the business um, of what is happening in your countries and how you are reflecting change. So Joanna, can we just talk a little bit about what you are up to and the massive growth that you are seeing with women investing in business in East Africa um, and beyond? You are doing remarkable work. Um, so you just tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah, just for context, Kasha is digital retail optimized for women's health and self-care. And so we built a digital platform really providing access to the mass market across East Africa and across emerging markets around women's health products, women's self-care products. And we're effectively monetizing that platform with corporations as well. And really Kasha started because, you know, we recognize women are extremely influential consumers, yet they're often seen, when we talk about women's health, it's often seen as, as, as a charity case, or maybe it's a niche product. 
but actually women drive 80% of consumer purchases. And when it comes to health, they are the decision makers for health in the family. They menstruate every month for over 40 years. And that's just menstruation. And then there's you know, so many other health needs that women have throughout the course of their lives. So the business case is, is quite clear. And then when you look at manufacturers like Johnson Johnson or Unilever, women are their target customers. They want to reach women directly. They want to reach those traditionally offline women in mass market. So it's, it's a huge opportunity. And I have to say, when Kasha started about five and a half years ago, and I started fundraising, you know, I, about 99% of my investor calls were really investors saying, but why would you focus on women? Like, why would you, why would not you open it up to everyone? Like, why, why do you, why do you want to be a niche play? And so not having that understanding of actually, if you win the hearts and minds of women, you win the hearts and minds of the majority of the population of the market. Uh, and so it was a lot of education in those early days. Now, fast forward, I think I answer that question, maybe 10% of new investor calls. I do not have to explain why we focus on women, where the opportunity is with women. It's a given, like there's, which is, which is fantastic. Um, I'm also seeing more and more women running, being involved in the decision-making of investment funds. And definitely when you talk about institutional investors, five and a half years ago, it was mostly men. And now things are changing. Not only are they decision-makers, there are more and more, especially within Africa, um, African investment funds that are led by African women with a clear understanding that women are a key opportunity in the market. Um, so, you know, 535 Ventures is run by a woman in South Africa. We have Alethea IDF out of Nigeria. Uh, Norskin 22 is a new fund. Two out of three of the leaders of that fund are women. Um, beyond half of the venture, I can go on and on. So this is a, it's a huge change. And it's no longer, you know, women are charity pays. Women are just impact. No, women are a huge business opportunity. Women should be built, especially tech platforms, should be built by women for women as well, because there's a deeper understanding there. And optimizing for a, the, a target customer that is the most influential absolutely makes business sense. So I see a massive shift in these five years. So, and I wonder, Ajaita, have you, have you seen the same? I mean, I'm, as you can see, I'm profusely nodding because I'm like, um, there's not that many differences. I mean, I, I, honestly, I could literally say, so everything that Joanna just said, and then a plus, right? And so, I mean, for me, um, I mean, everything you just said, I completely agree with um, every, every, every element of it, right? And, and in India's context, it's just even larger, right? Because we have 800 million customers uh, living in rural India. Uh, of which 51% are women. And ultimately, as you rightfully said, women are the most important influencers when it comes to decision-making for all kinds of purchases, right? Not even just for products for themselves, right? I mean, household decisions, they might not have the money, but they definitely have the power to influence decision-making. And I think that for me, just adding to what you just said, for us, it's also the fact that they're the most they're like the smartest sales force you can possibly invest in, right? Because they are ultimately influencers and they're the trust, they're the trust carriers, right? Today, a, a, a customer would rather have a 25 minute conversation with a woman and talk about all their problems and she can capture them as insights and turn them into nuggets and then help the PNGs of the world sell diapers at scale, right? I mean, this is a reality check that we need to understand where women are coming in as such an important element of business strategy and supply chain. Um, and in the world of technology, because data is now the most critical element, it is the oil of everything that we understand. When we are looking at that and we're looking at the role that women play, it's incredible to see that women, when they're able, to, when you're giving them the right technology and you're giving them the right tools, they can collect the most incredible data that allows you to create deep insights in a way that the apples of the world have been obsessing over us as consumers. But now imagine using that for good and actually creating and designing innovative solutions for the customers that you've been wanting to serve, right? And that's really what Frontier Markets has done, right? Over the last 10 years, you know, we've evolved from being a non-tech, energy only, not really gender inclusive company to a social commerce platform with only women's sales force 
really catering to a multitude of services from agriculture to finance, to healthcare, to essential services, to climate, appliances, consumer electronics, but all data driven through these powerhouse women, right? 12,000 plus women helped a million customers buy better solutions to address their life problems in a profitable way, right? I mean, like, you know, we've crossed $30 million in business in this last one year during COVID. And so when you start thinking about the power of what you can build with the right technology, investing in women in social impact oriented volatile places that is volume, like massive market opportunities, you're seeing yourself becoming a billion dollar company and it's real, you know? And, and it's really exciting to see, I think Joanna, as you rightfully said, the switch, because it's so interesting to now, I mean, I mean, Suzanne knows this about my journey better than anyone. Cause I mean, in the first five years, it was hell. It was hell to raise capital. Um, no one understood why you're working in rural areas. Supply chains and distribution was not sexy at all. Tech could not exist. And so in the last five years, all of a sudden, everyone sees the gender inclusion piece as a smart strategy. They see the fact that you have technology that's designed for the poor and you're reaching those ESG goals. And so ultimately you're seeing a shift and you're seeing investors that are male investors saying that, you know what? We really do need a better gender portfolio. And all of a sudden you end up becoming that token women entrepreneur that they wanna invest in because they wanna make their portfolio look better. I don't care, I'll play the game because ultimately we want that capital to show that we can do what we can, right? And, and I think the other thing that I'll just add in India, India's context is, you know what, the government has been shifting as well, right? You're seeing a really interesting shift of convergence where you have both policy, you have politics, you have a uh, blended capital, you have philanthropy, everyone's kind of aligning together to say, you know what, we need to create more women entrepreneurs faster. We're doing a really bad job. We have all this capital that we ideally would love to disperse. We have no idea how to do it. And it's exciting to see that people like Joanna and myself can then play these roles to actually help navigate and guide how to move big capital differently and design for the entrepreneurs that we are, but then also the future entrepreneurs to come, which is really exciting. I just, I want to ask both of you about, you know, a comment you made about the male investors in female-led businesses, because that's a role model play too for getting more men to, I mean, we know the statistics and Suzanne, you know this better than anyone, you know, less than, I mean, 4% of investment money goes into women or, and less than 1% into uh, uh, black. 2.2% into, from venture capital into women-led businesses. And then less than 1%. That's low as 1%. Um, and then into, um, you know, African-American led or black led businesses into Latinx led businesses and businesses from the places that we're really purporting to help. It's how it's less than half of that. So, yeah, I mean, and oh, globally, 1.3% of all assets are managed by women and people of color. I mean, this has to change. And when, there, when after we hear from Ajay and Joanna, I want to bring in something about the role of the banks in this picture. Okay. So after we hear, so I, I, like, talk to me about that. Like, how did you, you know, when men were investing in your business, A, what was the play? Like, how did you get the yes? Because everyone gets a no. So was there, you know, you got probably a lot of no's before you got a yes. Like, what was your secret sauce or what was the magic bullet to get the yes? And then, you know, <laughs> I, give yeah. us a give us your secret I mean, so that it's not. Joanne, a you mind? I'm going to go first on this one because it's been what's on top of mind for me because I am raising now my largest capital raise that I've done until date. It's our Series B, and I'm dealing with this like right now, and it's so interesting to see how much I've shifted as an entrepreneur. Um, early days, it was always about focusing on the poverty story, the impact story, and really talking about taking as little as you need because you needed to prove something, right, to the sector. Um, and so, I mean, Suzanne knows this in 10 years, I raised like $7 million and everyone's like, wow, that's amazing. And I was like, no, that's not. In 10 years to raise $7 million, great, you're profitable and great, you're growing, but actually you should have been able to raise a hundred, right? And why didn't you? It was, it was my doing, it was my perception of the market and also, and that's shifted so much, right? So today to shift from only impact first to talking about 
market opportunities, scale opportunities, becoming the next big unicorn, why it is a billion dollar business, you're suddenly speaking a very different language. Mm. Um, and you're interacting with um, all kinds of investors having the same conversation. So impact is still critical, but you're also very much talking about where exits can happen, where, you know, um, where the numbers are now becoming really massive. And you're really walking in saying you're ready to take on 20, 30, 50, $100 million because you are capable of managing that kind of money and, make, and taking it to that level of scale, which is a big shift. And actually, um, it's the right shift. I mean, I don't think it's about catering to male VCs or, or female VCs. It's about you also knowing as an entrepreneur where you are the right solution for the for the, for the business that you're operating, right? And so, um, and I think that's gotten a lot of different VCs excited because they're now finally seeing, you know, our male counterparts that kind of give that big Uber dream, right? We're able to actually pitch the same, but the difference is we actually have a track record that backs up our ability to take it to that next level. We've de-risked ourselves in a way that is really exciting for all kinds of investors. Um, and I think that's probably the way that all these men come in and they get quite excited. And then of course, it is about the fact that we're saying that, look, you'll get to learn more because you really don't understand gender. And here's the opportunity that we're posing that actually makes them also look better. So that's kind of how our approach came. but I'm curious to hear from Joetta. So you're pitching with bravado. Yeah, a lot more, a lot more and a lot more gravitas. Mm -hmm. There you go. Grace yeah. with grit. Yeah. Joanna. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think the wonderful thing about being an entrepreneur is you're always, you know, it's personal growth. You're, you have to improve yourself in many ways to, to grow your business. And I've always, and, and this is maybe for good or bad, I've always operated under the belief that I need to prove myself. We are not, you know, we're not entitled to anything. We have to prove ourselves every single day. We have to show the numbers. We have to make traction and progress. And that could have hurt me good or bad. Um, I do know alternatively, there's just like huge hype out there, right? And people tell the big story. And I think for, um, and it goes back to confidence as well. I've always had the big vision. Kasha has always been a, just a global company and I see exactly how we're going to get there. But I think it is about building that and having, you know, building this infrastructure, this company, this business that actually can achieve that vision. And I think, um, for me, it's just about that traction um, rather than, and, and, and I, I have heard that men do it differently and they, you know, and I've spoken with some of them, a fraction of the customers, a fraction of the revenue we do, but make a ton of traction. So I, I mean, I'm still learning in my journey as well, but I am getting more confident and I believe in the vision. And I think that that excites people because what we say we will do, we do. And I hope that that counts for something. You know, it's not just a story where they look back and they're like, you actually didn't accomplish any of these numbers, you know. So when we think big and we are aggressive and ambitious, we're going to hit those numbers. And I, and I think that, I mean, that's how I operate. But I know that the, the ecosystem's a bit different as well. Okay, Suzanne, give us, give us a story. So two things. One is I look at both Kasha and Frontier Markets, and I think about the constellation of different kinds of investors that have come in to back them along the way. And they include philanthropists, they include corporates and corporate venture capital and corporate impact capital. They include venture funds, they include high net worth individuals using their own wealth, and they include development finance institutions. And so, so public capital that is really out there to achieve both a development impact and a financial impact. And that what's exciting to me is these new kinds of partnerships and these constellation of different kinds of capital with different kinds of uh, additionality that they bring to the party. And then the other thing, the second point that I would make is I look at somebody like a UBS and UBS, largest wealth manager in the world, um, they have a philanthropy group, they have a foundation. They have a family office group. They have high net worth and ultra high net worth individuals. They have an investment banking group. They have client advisors who are helping people really deploy their wealth. The opportunity for someone like a UBS to think about how do they look across the bank from a responsible and sustainable investment perspective and say, how do we help our clients get in on this? 
how do we help our clients be part of this future? And how do we make sure that our own advisors are knowledgeable enough to be able to talk to our clients about this opportunity and to know what kind of capital we're talking about. And the value of philanthropy is that at the beginning stages of both frontier markets and Kasha and hundreds of others is often they need more philanthropically oriented capital to help them prove and get that early traction, prove that there's a market, prove that there's a product market fit, prove that they can have both impact and financial return. And then as they grow, it can get more and more commercial. And that trajectory doesn't off, it doesn't always happen in a completely sequential standpoint. It can be that it's really at the same time. And when I think about when, when Unilever came in with Kasha and said, um, we want to be here to make sure that, of course, you're going to help our business and we're going to help your business. But we also, they had a partnership with DFID, and which is now FCDO, the UK's development agency. And they said, but we want to be sure you're going to meet those, you're going to reach those women, both as employees and customers who are more marginalized, who are less able to afford these, these products or don't usually have that level of choice. And the idea that the Gates Foundation came in, right, and said, that's really important to us. So bringing together these different points of view on making sure that, again, um, we're reaching for both the commercial impact and the development impact and the, the impact on the lives of the people we really care about um, is really powerful. And I just see that now starting to really take hold. Well, I mean, these I, examples, oh, who's, who is going? Is that you, Joanna? Go ahead. I, I, I think Suzanne has an interesting point here. Um, you know, I, I had a corporate life before being an entrepreneur, and they do. And and I've heard some, I've heard some data which shows women don't have just like a linear path within their careers. And I wonder if that is the same, if that if that is also true with women um, growing their businesses. If you look, I mean, we've taken so many different types of investors. We started in Rwanda, you know, in Rwanda, and which is a small landlocked country in Africa. We took angel investors and impact investors and VCs and strategic corporates and DFIs. And, you know, we, and then for those who are just used to a very clear path, I mean, for us, it's been about, you know, just survival. What gets to the, what, what can get us to that next stage so we can prove it, we can knock it out of the water. And I do think we should look at when women successfully you know, raise investment into a company that eventually grows into a billion dollar business further, becomes a unicorn. What is, what does that path look like? And how does that differ with male counterparts? Because, you know, I've, had, I've heard this so many times as we raise rounds, oh, don't take money from this type of investor. Don't take money. You know, it's, it's, and you have to build the ecosystem in a way, and you need that capital to prove it. Um, so I think it's I think that that's something interesting, which is you do need to leverage all forms of investors and capital to 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 make these businesses big and and market leaders and global. But also like add the element. So two things that I'll just add to that is one, I don't actually think it's necessarily just a gender bias because I do think being a social entrepreneur, ultimately, um, given the nature of the geographies that we work in, the volatility and the realities that we end up facing. Um, we do end up having roller coaster rides, irrespective, right? Because um, I mean, just in India, in the last six years, it's been demonetization, policy changes, COVID pandemics. I mean, there's just been so many things, right? So, and you're working with a volatile community that is the most vulnerable. And so, fundamentally, you will end up needing uh, different kinds of partners to help navigate the challenges of the market in itself. And which is what makes, in my opinion, an impact entrepreneur like insane, insane, right? You're an insane entrepreneur when you're an impact entrepreneur. Um, so that's one element that I think is true across, I think, um, gender, gender norms. But I do believe that women leaders, as I've seen in the last couple of years, have done a better job in really building an ecosystem to like actually create a pathway for learning, to bring people along their journey, which I think is really powerful. But the second piece that I would say is that, and kind of going back to what Suzanne, you're alluding to with UBS's power, and, and this is something that we talk about a lot, especially as a global visionary saying that ideally, Joanna and I aren't the ones that are having to build that ecosystem on our own. Like we have a business to run, a business to scale. And frankly speaking, like I don't want to be that entrepreneur 
that is actually handling all different kinds of capital and trying to teach the sector on how to look at blended capital in a way that frankly, I don't have time for, right? Ideally, you're, we're getting partners that are helping us get that money so we can then do our job, which is create the impact and do the work that we need to in a way that's a lot more seamless. And so maybe that's where a lot of the linearity, linearity shifts, right, over a period of time, because our intention is to build an ecosystem and to build a community. And blended capital does create systems change and scale in this beautiful way, as I'm currently facing with the government right now and looking at unlocking different kinds of capital. But it's hard work while running a business on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. So. Listen, I think that uh, linear and entrepreneur is an oxymoron. I think that we got to zig and zag as, as entrepreneurs of any sort. Suni, I want you to bring this home for us. So um, I want you to wrap and I'm going to do a lightning round at the end. So just save me 30 seconds. Um, just talk about linking some of these findings to your research on the um, you know, women in value-based investing and what you have found um, in, in your research. Well, I, I think it really speaks to what's coming next. And I think the research has been done since 2017 as we move this forward. And I just, you know, listening to Joanna and talk about this is business, not charity. And Ajayta, you talk about the, um, it's not just impact. And Suzanne, even it, it starts with philanthropy, maybe that's how you have to get your start. The trick is where we go from here. And I, and I like to say the world has moved forward. We've gone from it's nice to have, right, to a must have, right? What we really want to be is it's smart to have. And then Ajayta, you get to the part where it's not just about 10% of their portfolio is set aside for this type of investing. It's the whole darn portfolio because it's just smart investing and good returns that also happen to have an, an impact as part of it. So I think we're very much headed that direction and I'm changing my vernacular just as I'm listening to you all. So I thank you all. The only other thing I will tell you guys, um, you mentioned it Ajayta, the role that you're playing and I know it can be frustrating for you maybe as well as an honor, but you guys are, cast very well. You're doing a terrific job in those roles. So thank you for all that you're doing to move us forward. Well, I, I have to say UBS is doing a phenomenal job too. And everyone, you'll see all the papers. Uh, role models, so incredibly important. If you could see her, you could be her. We talk about that all the time. You guys are incredible role models, all of you. I am so inspired. Um, role models, great for diversity. So important, uh, important role models for you. Anyone stand out inspiring female role models, Ajayta? I mean, Suzanne's sitting right here. So obviously you should know that she's the, the epitome of a role model for me um, in, in life. I mean, I feel like I started, like I can literally say that like from baby years to now, I guess adulthood in the last 20 years, I mean, she's really been that uh, pioneer for me. Why, does she, why is she a role model? Because she's been pushing this agenda forever and she's been doing it in a way that is so unapologetic and so resilient and just really driving it and bringing people like us along the way, right? Giving us that platform, giving us a chance to really think and, and make that happen. So I think she is number one for me. In the context of India, I would say the other role model I have is Paula Marivala, who is my first VC investor, right? She was the first person that came in and said, I might not make any money from you. I might, but you know what? I'm going to learn something. And I just think you're worth investing in. And so when you think about the role model, the, the role that women investors play when they are the trigger, like when they pull the first trigger, they really do end up setting you across a, a journey that allows you to see confidence and success in a real way. And I think that that's so important uh, for all of us. So those are my two. Thank you, Joanna. You know, I, um, I think it's just various people that where their qualities and their values um, inspire me and are great role models. And uh, I have to say it, you know, my mother has always been a go-getter. That woman is grit. Uh, and she showed me how to work hard. And, um, I, will, and I always just uh, really appreciate that. And then even our, our agents, our agents are incredible. And the businesses, the, the way they've grown in their own revenue and how they partner together to grow the business and everything they've been through to go through that journey is absolutely inspiring. Um, and then there's just, you know, there's women who have, you know, been there, done that on the global stage, like Angela Merkel and Christine Lagarde and all those where it was very rare for women to be on those platforms. So I think I just take a little bit from many women and I'm just, yeah, grateful to stand on the shoulders of those, those giants. Fantastic. Suzanne. 
So this is such a hard question, but I'll name two, both of whom are sadly no longer with us, but they were two of the godmothers of sustainable and responsible investing. Joan Bavaria, who started Trillium Investments, and Tessa Tennant, who started at a firm called Henderson and trained thousands of people to be sustainable, responsible investors way before it was a thing. Both of them not only led with their values, they led with they led their teams, they built diverse teams. Um, they had so much heart, but so they were so smart and strategic. And they both created a number of organizations which are, you know, thousands of people now who are making the change from an environment and sustainability standpoint and social impact standpoint. So for me, putting your money where your mouth is, putting your energy and your and really being conscious that this so much about of this is about relationships um, and really thinking about how we shift the system not just shift a dollar, but shift the system. These are my role models. Fantastic. In addition to the people I see on the screen. Fantastic, SUNY. Oh, I'll just leave it with that. I'm, I'm, I'm long of tooth here in this crowd. So all the women who are coming after us, um, including our two entrepreneurs who are on the screen, who are gonna carry the torch forward. And there's a lot more of you than there were when we all started. So I'll, I'll be inspired every day until I retire by these women. Well, that is fantastic. We always say a woman alone has power. Collectively, we have impact. Happy International Women's Day. Back to you, Amber.